Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. What a pleasure it is to have you here all tonight to this lecture series on the origins of the Second World War, a cataclysmic event that took cost the lives of some 55 million people and devastated several continents. We chose calling the lecture series Reinterpretations, Lasting Issues of Second World War. And it's great that so many of you actually showed up tonight, I mean, in this showery Oslo. Um, the main person of the day came here soaking wet because he forgot his umbrella at the Holocaust Center today. <laughs> but he is very courageous, so he is here with us. Um, I want to extend then, of course, a warm welcome to you, Professor Richard Overy, and you will be introduced much more f in detail in short in a few minutes. But let me just explain and say that this lecture almost has the same title as H. P. Taylor's classic famous study from the beginning of the 1960s, Origins of the Second World War. But that is 50 years ago. I do hope that Professor Overy will be as irreverent with regard to the received truths as Taylor was so many years ago and decades ago. Uh, I should introduce the host of tonight. My name is Guri Eltnes. I'm the director at the Norwegian Center for Holocaust and Minority Studies, and I'm an historian. And co-host is Professor Tom Christensen. You will see him in a few seconds. Historian, professor at the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. And together we have conceived this lecture series as a collaborative project between the Holocaust Center and the University of Tromsø, with the gender support of the ECPO Foundation. Thank you, ECPO. Without you, or we would not be here, and we would not be here. And if we succeed this fall, maybe something will follow up in 2020. The idea behind is simple. This fall marks 80 years since the outbreak of the Second World War, and next year we will be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, a celebration of the liberation. These two events supply a perfect reason to hold such a public lecture. No more, no less. In Norway, celebrating the end of the war starts this fall, up north in Finnmark in October. And the ending of the war certainly will be a word by celebration in the coming one and a half year all over. And that is actually the idea behind this series. The topics you will see in the folder you have on your seat, taken as a whole, we want this academic series to provide a global point of view. This was a global war, it was just not a Western war. We want to provide an international perspective on the Second World War, and Tom Christensen will speak a little bit more about that. You can see we start with Professor Overy. Next time, that is a Tuesday, the only Tuesday, everyone is a Thursday, is Maria Fritsche talking of the ordinary amidst the extraordinary encounters between the occupier and occupied in Europe. In October, Uli Jürgen Mohr, the time of the apocalypse, air power during the Second World War. And then in November, Anton Weisswendt, who is here today, Nazi mass crimes and politics of the UN Genocide Convention. And then ending in December with Deborah Lip Lipstadt, professor at the Emory University, speaking of the Eichmann trial in the context of the other Nazi cri <laughs> war crimes trials. So, we hope to see you again later on. Before Professor Tom Christen will introduce Professor Overy, let me share some practical information with you. It's very simple. We proceed with now intermission and conclude latest at 8 o'clock sharp. On this side of the room you will find food and drinks, and you may help yourself during the lecture, but please try to make it silently. And of course, there will be a conversation afterwards and then possible to ask questions and have answers after the lecture, following, of course, by a closing statement by the speaker. Again, most warm welcome to all of you. And Tom, the floor is yours. <laughs> now we go. Thank you. And. Uh, Perhaps I should say a few words about our thoughts when we made up the program. Because our main uh, aim was to um, shed light on 
uh, what made the Second World War a very special event, and also what marks it as different from most other wars. So, to put it simply, we are dealing with occupational regimes of various brutality. We are dealing with air power, which started with the uh, air defense system, the Battle of Britain, went on to strategic bombing, and ended, uh, ended with the, the atomic uh, explosion over Hiroshima in 1945. And also, we will address uh, <coughs> genocide, which is another of those very special and rare uh, uh, aspects of the Second World War. And we will start with Professor Richard Aubrey, uh, who will address the topic of why war, which is something that both uh, academic scholars and politicians and the public opinion have pondered for 80 years, why war. And it is an exceedingly great honor and pleasure to welcome <coughs> Professor Richard Aubrey here tonight. As everybody will know, he is among the most accomplished historians of the Second World War. He published his first work in 1973. I know it's quite challenging, but I must be brief in my presentation. But here's a few words. Aubrey was educated at Cambridge, where he held a teaching position from 1972 to 1979 at Queen's College. He then moved on to King's College London, where he taught from 1980 to 2004, from 1994 as a professor of modern history. I should perhaps remind the audience that from the 1970s, the War Studies Department at King's became by far the most prominent institution of its kind, with an overwhelming international reputation. More relevant uh, for this evening's lecture is his concise 1939 Countdown to War from 2009, which is highly recommendable. And I have not mentioned his uh, seminal works on the execution of air power during the Second World War. I shall wisely refrain from that since my word would soon approach extravagance. So with no further ado, the floor is yours. Richard, please. Well, thank you very much for those kind words of uh, introduction. Um, and thank you very much indeed to the Holocaust Center for inviting me to give the opening lecture in this series, which I'm very honored to do. It was quite a challenge to be told that I'm stepping in the shoes of A.T.P. Taylor, his story and I always admired uh, as I was uh, growing up as a young historian, uh, and you will judge by the end whether I've succeeded in doing so. I want to start off very briefly by reminding us about some of the ways in which the outbreak of war in 1939 has been interpreted. And I want to go on to explore uh, a variety of different ways in which we might explain it. For a long time, the assumption always was that the invasion of Poland was part of uh, Hitler's plan for world domination. One state after the other uh, would fall into the German lap. And Poland was just the next one after Czechoslovakia and Austria. That there was some grand plan um, which was generated in Germany. And indeed, that was the argument, of course, presented at the Nuremberg trial in 1945-46. The second thing is that for a long time, the idea has persisted that Hitler wanted war with Britain and France in 1939 and deliberately provoked them into war so that he could have his war in the West before perhaps waging some kind of war in the East. And indeed, that's an argument which had persisted to the present day. The third argument is that Hitler was pushed into war because of economic crisis. 
the German economy was so fragile, facing all kinds of pressures and difficulties, that the working class was becoming increasingly restless, and that Hitler in the end decided that war would be a way out. This would be an option that would solve his economic problems and quieten down the working class. Now, all of those are interesting arguments, but I will show, I think, today that almost none of them have stood the test of time. We need to approach the outbreak of war, I think, in a very different way. The first thing, I think, to emphasise is the place of Poland in Hitler's thinking. There was no plan for war. Poland was not on Hitler's list in the 1930s. In fact, quite the opposite was the case. For a long time, uh, Hitler and the German leadership in the 1930s believed that Poland would gradually gravitate into uh, the German orbit, that Poland would become a kind of satellite state, as Slovakia became, or Hungary and Romania later on became, anti-Soviet, perhaps a stepping stone to an eventual war uh, with the Soviet Union. What Hitler wanted, of course, was for Poland to accept uh, revision of the Treaty of Versailles, just as he wanted the Czechs to accept it, that they would abandon Danzig and it would become a German city again, that the corridor would suddenly become uh, German territory once more, that they would voluntarily give up Silesia and its rich industrial resources, which Poland had won in 1920. Poland, of course, very sensibly refused because they could understand what the implication was of becoming a satellite of the new German power. And it was that refusal, the realisation on Hitler's part that Poland was not going to play the role in his vision of Eastern Europe that he'd hoped for, uh, that he decided on war. In early April 1939, he called his generals together and asked them to prepare a campaign against Poland in the autumn, a short, sharp campaign uh, which would defeat the Poles. The Poles suddenly became for Hitler a mortal enemy, which they were not in 1938. Um, German propaganda played up, played up all the terrible things the Poles were doing to the German minority living in Poland and so on and so on. Um, Hitler, Hitler searched around for a casus belli so that he could find a justification for his war with Poland. Now, Poland had not been his initial aim. Uh, certainly in the course of 1939, uh, Poland became uh, the victim uh, in Hitler's view. But there are a number of other factors we need to consider in explaining Hitler's decision to turn to war against Poland in 1939. The first is to remember what had happened with the Czech crisis in 1938. There's no doubt that Hitler wanted a small war in the late 1930s. He said it. He wanted his army to be blooded. Uh, the army wouldn't... It was no point in having all this rearmament if the army didn't do something. Um, he'd wanted a small war against Czechoslovakia, planned in the spring of 1938. And he didn't get it, and he was deeply frustrated. He was also conscious, and I think it's a point we often forget as he looked around at his potential allies, that Japan and Italy had had their small wars. Japan had conquered Manchuria and was now at war with China. Uh, Italy had conquered Ethiopia. In fact, by the time the war against Poland broke out, the German armed forces had not been engaged uh, in violent conflict throughout the 1930s. And throughout 1939, Hitler was clear that he doesn't want another Munich. He doesn't want anybody to rein him in. He wants to be able to have his small war against the Poles, and he's convinced that he can make that war localised. The other thing to emphasise, I think, is Poland as living space, Lebensraum. Now, there's nothing new, of course, about the idea of Lebensraum. We all know about it. it was, uh, it's featured in most books about uh, German expansion in the 1930s. But it's very seldom put into context. What did it mean? What did it mean uh, for Hitler? And I want to argue tonight that one of the things we're missing out when we think about Germany's 
war on Poland as the imperial paradigm that Hitler adopted in the 1930s. We're so used to thinking that the war against Poland is about reversing Versailles, ending uh, German humiliation and so on, Danzig the corridor and so on. But what we've missed, I think, is that uh, the 1930s ushered in a new age of imperialism and Hitler wanted to be part of that new age. So we go back to 1931 and the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. We go back to Mussolini and his invasion of Ethiopia. Both of these were about building a new empire in the 1930s, and nobody stopped them. The League of Nations did not stop the Japanese, the League of Nations did not stop the Italians, and nor did the great powers involved. For Hitler, by the late 1930s, it seemed clear that the possibility of building a German empire again in Eastern Europe was a real possibility. Now, it's worth emphasising, of course, that Hitler was not remotely interested in re-establishing German colonies overseas. This was part of the Versailles settlement that he could easily live with. He wanted empire, continental empire, in Eastern Europe. Now, he believed that the source of British and French power, the reason they won the First World War, was the fact that they had huge territorial empires, that this was really a source of their military and economic strength. Indeed, it's interesting that Hitler knew by heart uh, the territorial area, a number of square kilometres occupied by the British Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch Empire, the Belgian Empire. Um, and he was constantly aware that Germany did not possess an empire. Indeed, after the 1919 settlement, Germany was smaller than it had been before territorially. He also believed that the world was dividing up into economic blocks, that the global, globalisation of the economy, which had happened before 1914, was effectively over. That the British had their sterling area block, the French had their franc area block, the Americans had their dollar block in, uh, uh, in the New World, the Japanese were building a yen block in Eastern Asia. In other words, that the age of global economy was over. You were going to build... Uh, basically self-sufficient economic areas, blocks which you could dominate. Uh, and Hitler's uh, view was that that block would be established somewhere in Eastern Europe, even perhaps including eventually uh, conquest of the Soviet Union. And Poland would be part of that block. Uh, and Polish territory would be part of Germany's new empire. Now, there was a long tradition in Germany in thinking about Poland and the East, in inverted commas, as imperial, potential imperial territory. Uh, and Hitler was, I think, well aware of that long trajectory in German thinking about the East. So that when he finally had Poland in his sights, he wanted to turn Poland into colonial space. And I think that's a point which is worth stressing. We, we know all about the, the occupation policies, we know what happens when Germany conquers Poland, but, but we need to bear in mind that, that what Hitler, and indeed many German leaders, and indeed many German military leaders wanted, was at last a chance to turn Poland into colonial space. And indeed, that's what Hitler told his generals in May 1939. The issue, he said, is not Danzig at all, the issue is German living space. It is about developing German empire in Eastern Europe. Turning Poland into colonial space, as I've called it, of course, involved other things as well. One of the things which happens in September 39 in Poland is that uh, the SS Einsatzgruppen these special units sent in behind the armed forces um, are supposed to be killing the Polish elite, politicians, cultural leaders, academics, clerics, and so on. These murder squads were there for a reason. They were there because what, what Hitler wanted was to eliminate Polish national life and Polish culture, to demodernize Poland, so you could turn it into something you would call colonial space because that elite was gone and all you would have less left would be Polish 
subjects. It has to be said that this is an aspect of the outbreak of war in September 39, which historians still grapple with, because the decision to send in the Einsatzgruppen to murder the Polish elite is extraordinary in the history of modern European war. Where does it come from, uh, this desire to behave atrociously against a conquered people? Unfortunately, of course, we don't have the conversations that Hitler and Himmler had about what they were going to do in Poland. These are precisely the kinds of things that would be discussed in private, no record. And so actually pinning down precisely when Hitler decided he was going to turn Poland into colonial space and what was required to do that is still elusive for historians. What is not elusive, of course, is the evidence. That's exactly what happened. They murdered tens of thousands of Poles. Uh, Polish elite was decimated uh, in the months after German victory. Resettlement plans meant kicking Poles out of their farms and homes and sending in German settlers. Um, it meant uh, the destruction of Polish education and culture, closing down the universities, saying that Poles could only go to school to a certain level. The whole program uh, in Poland was about, as I've said, the imperial paradigm. At last, here was an area they could call empire, and they could treat the Poles as subjects. And that's exactly what they did. Poles had to get off the pavement when a German was walking past. They had to raise their hats uh, when a German soldier uh, passed them in the street. Uh, here was an imperial paradigm borrowed from 60 or 70 years of violent European imperialism outside Europe. This is how you could behave in Africa or the Middle East or in Asia. And here was Hitler saying you could behave like that in Europe as well. But what he did not want, I would argue, what he did not want was a simultaneous war with the West. What he hoped was that the West would simply give in, as they'd apparently done over the Munich crisis in September 1938. Now, many historians have argued the opposite, that he decided he would turn to the West, that now the West would become the enemy. He would finish the West first, and then he would turn to the East. But there simply is no evidence. You come through all the evidence available to us during the course of the spring and summer of 1939 in Germany, and there just is no evidence that Hitler wanted that war. He kept telling his generals and his uh, colleagues uh, that the war would be localised, and they kept saying, well, we're not so sure, and he would say, no, no, it will definitely be localised. Then we have the argument, of course, that economic pressure, in fact, changed his mind, that whether he liked it or not, he had to wage war against Britain and France because the German economy was facing a crisis, a financial crisis, a crisis of trade, a shortage of foreign currency, and so on and so on. But again, there's almost no evidence whatsoever that Hitler was influenced in his thinking about war by what was happening to the economy. Of course, there were economic motives, Poland would bring a great deal of agricultural land under German control. You would have the rich iron ore and coal resources. You would be able to embrace uh, the Polish economy into this broader German economic bloc. But that's different, of course, from saying that he was pressured into war against Britain and France because he was worried about uh, economic uh, his own economic problems. And indeed, making war on Britain and France would not make those economic problems easier, but worse. It would cut off uh, access to foreign currency even more. It would damage German trade uh, fundamentally because Britain and France would impose, of course, an immediate blockade. The argument that he went to war with Britain and France because his economic problems pushed him that way is an argument that persists, but it seems to me it has no real foundation. Now, of course, we all know that in March, the end of March 1939, uh, Britain and France gave a unilateral guarantee to Poland of Poland's sovereignty. Uh, this enraged Hitler, but it doesn't explain uh, his decision for war. That was governed much more by the implacable opposition of the Poles to making any concessions to the Germans across the winter and spring of 1939. 
Indeed, Hitler convinced himself throughout 39 that Britain and France would really not do very little. Uh, sorry, would not do very much. That they would make a lot of noise, that they would huff and puff and so on, they mobilised the League of Nations perhaps, but they wouldn't in the end obstruct his war with Poland. That this would be an act of will on his part. He had the will to wage war. The British and the French lacked the will to wage war. But just in case, he very famously, of course, made his pact on the 23rd of August, the anniversary is uh, tomorrow, of course, his pact on the 23rd of August with Stalin's Soviet Union in order to avoid any threat of Soviet intervention. Uh, but also, he hoped, of course, uh, to end any prospect that the British and French might interfere in his war with Poland. Indeed, the following day, he expected to hear news that the Chamberlain government had fallen in Britain as a result of the Nazi-Soviet pact. So convinced was he that he ordered the armed forces to begin preparations for a war against Poland to open on the 26th of August. We all know, of course, it didn't break out on the 26th of August. Uh, Britain ratified a treaty with Poland on August the 25th, and Hitler was momentarily taken aback, thought for perhaps he misjudged what the British and French would do. But as it became clear that the British and French were also sending out feelers of one kind or another, diplomatic feelers of one kind or another, uh, he regained his composure. The following day, he ordered the army to prepare for war on the early morning of September the 1st, 1939, and he never wavered from that. He re remained convinced that in the end the British and French would back down, uh, that he would confront them effectively with a fait accompli. Uh, he would conquer Poland and there was nothing that they could do about it. And famously, as we all know, when news finally came through that Britain had declared war on the morning of September the 3rd, he was sitting with Ribbentrop, his foreign minister, uh, in the Chancellery, and he turned angrily to Ribbentrop and said, well, what now? Well, apocryphal or not, there's no doubt that for Hitler it was not what he wanted. He didn't want that. He wanted to be able to wage his short war against the Poles, establish German hegemony in Eastern Europe uh, and the British and French. Well, uh, he would deal with them perhaps later. Indeed, his uh, Comments to his generals suggested that he thought if there had to be a settlement with the West, it would come at some point in the mid-1940s, but not in 1939. Now, that, of course, raises a very important question. Why did Britain and France declare war? Now, the focus of much of the research of the last 10 years on the outbreak of war has shifted from looking at Germany and shifted back to looking at Britain and France, because that is, in fact, the question. Germany did not declare war on Britain and France. Britain and France declared war on Germany. Why did we do it? Neither state wanted war, wanted another world war again in the 1930s. They were also, we need to remind ourselves, no friend of Poland, indeed, for a long time, through 37, 38, even early 39, they assumed that the Poles really would gravitate into the German orbit, that they really would become uh, pro-German. They deeply distrusted the Poles, disliked the Poles' anti-Semitism um, and the authoritarian nature of uh, the Polish regime. Um, during the Munich crisis, as we know, the Poles took advantage of the crisis to seize some Czech territory themselves. So for the British and French, right up until the point where the guarantee was made in March 1939, Poland was a little bit outside uh, their radar. It was not a country that they felt particularly committed to. The guarantee itself, of course, was accidental. Following the German occupation of Prague, March the 15th, 1939, the British government panicked. The intelligence agencies fed through to Chamberlain news that the Germans might next be moving to Poland, uh, perhaps in a matter of weeks. There's still some debate about whether this was done intentionally by the British intelligence services, uh, mischievously, in fact, to firm Chamberlain up. But whatever the motive behind the intelligence reports, Chamberlain reacted immediately. He announced in the House of Commons a unilateral guarantee of Polish sovereignty. 
was followed by French guarantee, but also sovereignty, guarantee of the sovereignty of Romania and a number of other countries uh, as well, not just Poland. Now, this was an unpredictable crisis. The Poles themselves didn't really want the guarantee and not quite sure what it meant, whether this would actually be more dangerous for them than not having the guarantee, what, what effect it might have uh, on uh, Hitler and the German leadership. But for Britain and France, of course, the guarantee was not really about Poland. It was not about Poland as such. It was about putting down a marker to Hitler, saying that there were going to be no more occupations, no more Austria, no more Czechoslovakia. Um, the aim of the guarantee was not at Warsaw. The aim of the guarantee, of course, uh, was at Berlin. Now, German imperialism, like the imperialism of Italy and Japan that I've talked about, in other words, the development of a, a new imperial, a new age of imperialism in the 1930s, was very difficult for the British and the French to cope with. There were threats in Asia, there were threats in the Middle East and Africa, and now there were threats in Europe. Uh, what were they to do? Uh, their empires were unstable anyway. There were nationalist stirrings throughout the French and British Empire. Uh, the British and the French had had to act violently on numerous occasions in the 20s and 30s in their imperial area. Clearly, uh, ex exerting global power was becoming more and more difficult for Britain and France. But Italian, Japanese and German imperialism uh, was thought to be a, 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 an even greater threat. This would accelerate the destabilization of the British and French global imperial position. And that's really why they shifted in 1939 to the idea that you would have to confront Germany. Germany was the most dangerous of those three powers. You had to confront Germany. Uh, and if you did so successfully, then you could rebuild a world order in which the British and French empires will once again be safe. We also need to remember that Britain and France both began their rearmament a considerable time before 1939. It's often argued that everything was done too late. They did it in the big rush in 39, and it's too late uh, to stop Hitler. But in fact, British and French rearmament had begun, well, it began in the, in the period after Hitler came to power, but it accelerated in 36 with big rearmament programs put forward by both countries due to reach fruition 1939-1940. So that if you had to confront German power, for both Britain and France, 39-40 was a good time to do it because rearmament was up and running. Very soon, uh, their rearmament would outstrip, between them, would outstrip uh, German war production. Growing confidence, in other words, in 1939, that if you had to obstruct Germany, if you had to put down a marker, if you wanted to save the existing global system, that this perhaps was the point to do it. But also very critical was a change in British and French public attitudes to war. Now we need to remind ourselves that for most of the 1930s there was a strong anti-war movement uh, in both countries. Not necessarily pacifist, but anti-war. They're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, a mass anti-war movement in Britain, more than a million, million and a half people in various organisations, um, uh, affiliated to various organisations which were anti-war. No more war. Large pacifist movement too, which is completely opposed to the idea uh, that Britain would ever go to war again. But in 1939, the anti-war lobby began to change its view, began to argue that the only way, in fact, to outlaw war was more war, that there would be no alternative really now to having a war with Germany because Germany posed a mortal threat, um, a mortal threat in the end to the idea of European civil and world civilization. And if that was the case, with resignation, you had to accept war. Uh, with Germany, and after that, you could set about uh, putting the world to rights again. 
Um, and this was a shift in attitude which you can chart very easily across the course of 1938-1939. A prominent pacifist in both countries uh, came away from their pacifism and said that because of Hitler, they would have to embrace the idea of a necessary violence. Now, what kind of violence would there be? Now, I said Britain and France were not particularly interested in Poland. And it's worth emphasising that they began war planning in March 1939, uh, even before they'd made the guarantee. And Germany, of course, was the war uh, that they were planning for. And the Allied war plan was based really on the experience of the First World War. They expected there to be a three-year war of attrition, that Germany would somehow be bottled up um, by the Maginot Line in France, by uh, a, a defensive line somewhere across uh, northeastern France. Um, the German economy was fragile and therefore allied economic warfare would wear down the German economy uh, and the capacity to continue uh, making war. And then Germany would be bombed, bombed heavily, um, and the bombing too uh, would bring Hitler and the German people to their senses. They would then restore an independent Poland after their three-year war was over. A repeat, not this time of 1914-18, but a repeat of 1919. Uh, both Britain and France were curiously locked into their memories of the First World War. Now, we might say that that was short-sighted. It was indeed short-sighted, but it's extraordinary when you go through the planning documents from this period, on into 1940 as well. They were confident that Germany could be defeated, that Germany would be bottled up, and that their three-year programme for war uh, was the right one. But they also hoped, of course, that Hitler would be deterred, as he'd been, they thought, in 1938. Indeed, for the British and the French, despite everything we know about the Munich Conference and our view that this was a, uh, a, a, an abdication by the Western powers of their responsibility. The West saw this as an act of deterrence, that Hitler didn't have his war against the Czechs. He got the Sudetenland, uh, but he didn't get his war with the Czechs. And in 1939, he might be deterred again. They might, in the end, have to give him Danzig to keep him quiet, but he could be deterred again, that he would back down. Now, the British and French intelligence services provided a stream of material throughout the summer of 1939 to convince the French and British government that this really was realistic. Uh, they highlighted all the economic problems. They kept searching for evidence of popular unrest inside Germany. Every time they got a snippet of news, they blew it up into potential revolutionary crisis. So that their conviction that Hitler might be deterred if they stood firm was based on Intelligence that we now know, of course, is entirely erroneous. Um, if it was not possible to deter him, then, of course, they were prepared to embrace world war. Now, these two convictions collided in the summer of 1959. Hitler's conviction that the West would back down, the British and French conviction that Hitler was bluffing, and if you just stood up to him, it would deter him from waging war. And we know, of course, what the consequence was of that collision of convictions. Now, for Hitler, of course, the Polish war fitted really with what he wanted. He got what he wanted. He got his little war, a very successful little war, all over in four weeks. Um, he got colonial space. He got a large slice of new empire better than the Czech-Austrian states he'd already absorbed. Um, Poland was a, a, a potential source of agricultural wealth, mineral resources, and, of course, a subject population that could be forced into labour for the Third Reich. He also got what he wanted with the destruction of the Polish elite. Operation Tannenberg, as it was called, was unleashed immediately. The Einsatzgruppen followed the army into Poland, killing people as they went, and carried on killing over the months that followed.
But what he did not want, as I've said, was world war. And if you're at war with Britain and France, it is a world war. World war, because Britain, a, a war with Britain means a war with Australia, with Canada, with South Africa, with India. Or with France means a war with France's extensive empire. And both the British and the French governments emphasised that, that they were not alone. They were waging war uh, with their empires. This was world war. Now, world war needed more explanation. German propaganda throughout the summer of 39 had been directed at the Poles, that the Poles deserved what they were going to get, that the Poles behaved atrociously towards the German minority, and so on and so on. This was something you could explain to the German public reasonably well. But explaining to them why Hitler had misjudged the mood of Britain and France and plunged Germany once again into world war was more difficult. We all know that when news of war came, the German public did not leap about, wave flags, it was opposite. They all slunk home, uh, depressed at the prospect that they were going to face a Second World War again in a generation. So how was it explained? Well, Hitler blamed the Jews. Now, blaming the Jews for things, of course, uh, in the Third Reich had quite a long history. But I think it's very important from our point of view to recognise that the outbreak of war with Britain and France in September 39 was the point at which Hitler moved together his military and strategic thinking and his anti-Semitism. That the only way you could actually explain why Germany was now facing world war was to blame the Jews. Well, first of all, of course, we know that on January 30th, 1939, the anniversary of the, German, of the Nazi seizure of power, he had already made his famous threat that if the Jews ever dragged Germany again into a global war, they would be the ones to suffer. So already, uh, months before the outbreak of war, Hitler had connected these two things together, the prospect of war uh, and his war against the Jews. Now, historians have not taken that declaration very seriously, but I think we do need to take it very seriously. Two years later, when the United States was clearly siding with Britain uh, and then finally declared war on Germany, was the point at which Hitler unleashed the genocide, convinced that the reason the United States was at war with Germany was because the Jews had pushed Roosevelt into war. But the start was the war with Poland. On September the 4th, he made a radio broadcast to the German people. Why are Britain and France declaring war? He said it's because of a Jewish democratic uh, international enemy. Um, a propaganda trope which continues really throughout the rest of the Second World War. From the start, in Hitler's mind, the Jews were to blame. Now, Polish Jews, of course, suffered immediately as a result of the German victory and occupation. Uh, forced labour programmes, pushed into ghettos, deportation, expropriation of Jewish wealth, and so on. There was no room for Jews in Hitler's colonial space. Uh, and as Hitler's empire expanded into Eastern Europe with the invasion of the Soviet Union, that became more and more explicit. The Jews, as a result of the war uh, uh, in September 39, became increasingly vulnerable and isolated. It's also worth reminding ourselves, and I think we often do forget, of course, that the other uh, um, uh, victor nation in September 39 was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, on September the 17th, also invaded Poland, occupied the eastern part, under the terms more or less agreed in the Nazi-Soviet Pact of August the 23rd. And it's worth reminding ourselves again um, that the Soviet Union, too, had a policy about Jews. Indeed, for the first two years uh, of Soviet occupation of eastern Poland, Jews suffered probably more under the Soviet Union than they did under Germany. The Soviet Union rounded Jews up, sent them to the Gulag, uh, murdered rabbis, closed down synagogues, um, uh, outlawed uh, the Jewish Sabbath, and so on and so on. Um, but the majority 
of Jews living in eastern Poland, which was the area of the old Tsarist Pale of Settlement, uh, a very large Jewish community in eastern Poland, uh, was raked over by the Soviet Union in two years of occupation between 39 and 41. So as Jews in Poland, whether you lived in the western German-occupied part or you lived in the Soviet eastern-occupied part, you were going to be victimised by one one totalitarian regime or another. Now, a question that's often asked, of course, is could the war have been averted? Well, there's an extreme version, of course, which is that um, that, that Britain and France just abandoned the Poles. Nothing they could do to help them. Um, They couldn't do much for Poland in 1945, so why didn't they just give it up in 1939? But there are other factors that we might consider. If the Poles had given in, there would not have been war, certainly not on that scale. If they'd given Hitler what he'd demanded in the spring of 39. But the Polish government knew that if you gave that gave that away in March 39, you would give a great deal more away. You would give away Poland's independence in the end. Uh, and it was unlikely that any Polish regime would accept that in 1939. Well, if the West had just appeased and not guaranteed Poland, well, that's possible, of course. But by that stage, there was strong sentiment, both at government level and at public level, uh, against uh, further concessions to Hitler uh, and against accepting uh, continued German expansion in Eastern Europe. If the Soviet Union um, had stood up and said, you're not going to do anything else, you're not going to invade Poland, we're going to oppose you, uh, would that have made a difference? Well, it's sometimes argued that it would have been. But we, we need to understand Stalin's view in uh, 1939. He played with the British and French, saying, let's have a military alliance, let's encircle Germany, and so on and so on. But it's almost certain he did not want that. He didn't want the risk of war for the Soviet Union. And indeed, uh, the Nazi-Soviet pact fulfilled almost everything that Stalin wanted. Put him in a position um, where he was not going to be involved in war and where he could begin to extend Soviet power uh, into Eastern Europe uh, without facing opposition from the West. Well, the only thing, really, of course, that would have stopped war in September 39 is if Hitler had backed down. On September the 1st, Chamberlain sent him um, uh, an ultimatum, a semi-ultimatum, saying that you have to withdraw your troops from Poland. Um, He didn't, because he thought that, in the end, the British and the French were bluffing. But there was no possibility that Hitler uh, would withdraw in September 1939. He was committed to the idea of war and committed to the idea now that he could build this new German empire. All those involved were locked into a collision course in September 1939 for different reasons. The room for manoeuvre largely disappeared. German imperialism was too important for Hitler and too threatening for the West. Now, are there any lessons we might learn today, 80 years on, from what happened in September 1939? Well, I'm often asked by journalists that uh, can we expect World War III in the near future? Uh, And I I generally um, play them down a bit. Um, But there's a great deal of talk now about, you know, is there going to be a new world war? Well, I think there won't be a world war, and there certainly won't be a world war anything like the war that broke out in 1939. But in Poland, there is growing anxiety about Polish security. They look at Putin's Russia and the possibility of growing Russian domination, perhaps again, in Eastern Europe. They worry that NATO may leave them in the lurch, particularly with Trump, who's views of NATO responsibilities are increasingly uh, ambivalent. Polish security seemed clear in the 1990s. It seems much less clear now. But I think it's very important to stress that history doesn't repeat itself. However much Poles may fear 
their position today. And you can see why it's embedded in their history of the last uh, century. Uh, it's embedded in their history. Uh, but the age of territorial imperialism, of which they were a victim in the 1930s, is long gone. It's not going to happen again, and certainly not going to happen in that form. Sadly, the only thing that we can say about the crisis in 1939 unleashed by Hitler, of course, is that anti-Semitism, irrational fantasies about the Jews, about Jewish power, about Jewish culture, about the extent to which Jews undermine um, existing states, has not disappeared. Um, and in some cases seems to be, once again, in the ascendant. So this is one lesson we need to learn from 1939. It is that fantasies about Jewish um, power, fantasies which fuel this anti-Semitism, have to be contested all the time, and they still have to be contested 80 years later. Sadly, despite German defeat in 1945, the spectre of anti-Semitism is still with us today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your, for your lecture. Uh, I was wondering if, if I could uh, take advantage, uh, advantage of my position and ask the first question. And, and uh, are we having a discussion? Uh, uh, or? Yes, in a minute. We will, mm. we will yes. Uh, you have basically been talking about the great powers, but there were also a lot of smaller countries spinning in the orbit, the European orbit. Yeah. So, could you say something about how the great powers were thinking about, for example, the northern neutrals, the, the low countries, the, the Nordic countries? Uh, and I'm asking because war came to Finland in late November mm. 1939 mm. and to Denmark and Norway in, mm. in April uh, 1940. So uh, could you say something about the considerations uh, and, 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 and what countries like uh, uh, Britain, France, Germany, even Russia, the Soviet Union, mm. were thinking about uh, the role and the mm. importance of the sm smaller countries in, in Europe. Mm. Well, I think they hadn't thought a great deal about it. Um, the British and French um, privately, I mean, they guaranteed Poland, Romania, and Greece, um, so on, but they, uh, but they also privately had a kind of map in their mental map in which they would protect Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Romania, and so on. But uh, the Nordic countries didn't feature particularly on, uh, on, on that map. And it certainly didn't feature on uh, a German map because Hitler hadn't expected it to, to become World War, that he would have to start thinking about you know, what was going to be uh, the problem on his, uh, on his northern flank and so on, what would be the problem in the Balkans. Um, I think for a, for a, 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 a long time, um, Hitler's, Hitler's vision and that of those around him had focused very much on Eastern Europe and perhaps some eventual war with the Soviet Union. Um, but smaller states didn't feature um, a great deal. Uh, and they're, they're, they're plunged into war in 1940 because of the circumstances of World War, because of the war that's declared by Britain and France in, in 1939. Mm. Okay, thank you. Goody? I think maybe we should step over there, and you should yeah, yes, be in the middle. Um, yeah. And I think someone is in the room with microphone somewhere. Yes? Hmm. So, let's first open up for questions from the floor. And the first one out, and, and could you please present yourself uh, first? Uh, Anton Weissman, I'm a researcher at the Holocaust Center. Um, I would like to reflect on this imperial colonial paradigm. In the past, uh, let's say, 10 or 15 years, it had become almost commonplace to make this linkage between the German colonial adventure, specifically suppression of Herero uprising in 1905 and the Nazi genocide in Eastern Europe, 
particularly in genocide studies. But what I'm missing here is a bit of a sort of empirical evidence. Uh, do we have sort of transfers, transference of knowledge, sort of individual connection appointments, or even on the level of rhetoric? Or does it remain sort of on the level of speculation, or would it be even would you say it was kind of fallacious approach to, to make this direct link between these two genocides, the first genocide mm. over the 20th century and then the next genocide, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm aware of the literature and uh, it is indeed strained, the, the relationship. But what is not strained, I think, is, is the extent to which Hitler and others around him were influenced by that imperial, broader imperial paradigm. And we looked at what the, um, the other empires were doing. We looked at the violence of the other empires. They looked at, at Mussolini's empire building, which was particularly important as a model for them. Uh, colonial administrators, Italian colonial administrators and policemen were invited to Berlin. They met in conference. They discussed how you treated the colonial people. Um, and with the invasion of Poland, uh, the rhetoric becomes a colonial rhetoric. Um, many of the key people, Hans Frank, who becomes uh, governor of the government general in, in Poland, uh, talks openly about the fact that they have now created colonial space. Uh, but they don't refer back to South East Africa, no. They don't refer back to the, the, early, um, the early genocide. Um, I mean, for them, their models are actually much more French and British imperialism, actually, than looking back at, uh, at, at German imperialism. Uh, and their view is that, um, you know, the British and the French and Italians can treat people that way, you know, that's what empire is. And so you treat the Poles that way, because that's going to be your empire. Uh, Do you want to follow up, Anton? And uh, Sven? <coughs> Please, a microphone here and in the front. Uh, There's such a heavy, strong light here, we don't hmm. see you. Please, yeah. oh, you're, you're in the darkness, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this really interesting lecture. Do you hear me? It's okay. Yeah. And, and uh, present yourself. Yes, please. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my name is Sven Holzmark. I'm from the Norwegian Institute for Different Studies. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times, of course, uh, tomorrow's anniversary of the uh, pact, yes. Soviet-German pact. <coughs> and also, you suggested the priority of the Eastern uh, direction in Hitler's war planning, war priorities, and also uh, confirmed what uh, uh, seemed to be uh, a consensus agreement that the war, the decision to go to war against Poland was taken, was made. So what then if there had not been the 23rd of August agreement if there had not been the non-aggression treaty, which I mind primarily, uh, what would the Germans have done if the Soviets had actually reacted? What would possibly have been the German response? And here, here I have in mind, in particular, the uh, uh, recent Wallace book by uh, Rolf Dietrich Müller. Der Feind steht im Osten. And his thesis is that Hitler was actually actively planning for war against the Soviet Union in the summer of 1939. Mm. So again, would a possible scenario have been that the Red Army would have responded, moved into Poland, and that could have been the occasion for Hitler's war against the Soviet Union already in 1939. Contrafactual, but I would like to have your thoughts about this. Mm. Thank you. Well, of course, this is, I mean, the volume is the pact did happen, so actually wondering what would happen if there was no pact is, is, is speculative. Uh, I think Müller enormously exaggerates the contingency planning of the German armed forces for the war against the Soviet Union. Um, I think if there had been no pact, Hitler would, because in the end it made no difference, because only two days later the British guaranteed Poland in the, uh, the, the Anglo-Polish Treaty, um, he would have carried on anyway, he would have just taken the risk. There was too much at stake for Hitler in losing face. It's interesting, you look at what happens after Munich, when he wanted his war with the Czechs, and he got everybody up, and you know, the armed forces, everybody was, you know, was supposed to be ready now for the war with the Czechs. 
Um, and you know, private comments from people around him show that there was, you know, was uh, you know, angry, disillusioned, and so on. That's, you know, he was frustrated at not getting that uh, at war with the Czechs. Um, and he was determined that, you know, in the end, nobody was going to obstruct him. Uh, I think that the the, the, the pact, and in Hitler's mind, it's only a temporary pact, of course, because at some point he's going to there's going to be a, a reckoning with the Soviet Union. Um, but the pact was supposed to seal that. It was supposed to make it clear that the British and French were not uh, engaged. In, and he was completely disconcerted by that because he expected the following day of the British and French to crumble and so on, to have the war with Poland on the 26th of August and so on and so on. And that doesn't happen. But I think it would have happened anyway. But I don't think he would have uh, waged war then with the, the Soviet Union. Um, partly I mean, because in the end, the Red Army is not going to do that. Um, Stalin is extremely wary uh, of, uh, of German power and the rise of German power. Um, and once he has the pact, of course, he's got permission to move into the Baltic states. He's got permission then to, to do what he wants with the Finns. He can uh, increase the Soviet security zone in the East uh, as a safeguard, of course, against what the Germans might, might do at a, a later stage. But a, a Soviet... Um, uh, invasion of Poland to stop the, uh, the Germans doing what they were doing, I think, is is quite implausible. Right? I think Müller does exaggerate it, but there are plenty of historians who argue that the critical thing, of course, is well. There's a new book actually just come out, just got a new book of Hitler, which argues uh, that Hitler's real target is the West, the United States and Britain, um, and the Soviet Union is instrumental. The war, the Soviet Union, will get Germany rich resources. Um, well, free Germany entirely. She'll have a huge blockade-free economic area and she can draw on those resources uh, in the end to compete with the British Empire and the United States for a uh, you know, position as a world power. A kind of, uh, this is a kind of Mackinder vision of the conquest of Eurasia and what it, what it means. Um, but for Hitler, that's not something he's able to do or willing to do in, in 1939. He moves step by step, he moves cautiously, um, uh, and yet the war against Poland seems rather uncautious because, you know, there's plenty of evidence that Britain and France are going to obstruct him. But, um, but war with the Soviet Union will come later, not sooner. Other questions? Yes, we have a microphone there. Yeah. Um, it's coming. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Sofia Oftedal. Um, I have a three-folded question. Uh, first, in Romania, it was um, the, the king was of German extraction, a uh, Hohenzollern uh, dynasty. So, did 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 Hitler occupy Romania, or or just pass through, or something? The second uh, fold of the question is, um, what's about that about superior race and inferior race? Uh, because in the States, they, people say there are only three races and, and the Jews are part of one of those three. Uh, uh, they don't say superior or inferior. And the third part of the question is, is did Hitler think that the superior race started in, in Iran or something and then they, they came from, from there or something? That they are superior races because they come from there or something? Thank you. Well, there's a few other unrelated questions. Um, the first thing about Romania is the Germans didn't occupy it formally, but they certainly sent a um, strong military mission there and they dominated the Romanian government um, from uh, 1940 onwards, partly because they wanted to safeguard their oil supplies from Romania. Um, but the question about inferior and superior races uh, fits in really, I think, with what I've been talking about in terms of German imperialism and their view of uh, why their imperialism was justified. Um, and it's interesting because the same justification is used in Italy and in Japan, the idea that there are uh, particular peoples who are suited to rule um, by nature of their culture and so on, um, by nature of you know, their vigorous, energetic young people um, and people who are destined to be ruled. Um, and in the German case, uh, that that um, 
paradigm is applied to the Poles, later on applied to the Russians as well, um, that the only thing the Poles were really fit for was to be subjects. The same thing was applied to the Czechs as well, actually. The Czechs, too, were only fitted to be subjects, not to be citizens. And that's an dis important distinction in the 1930s, because in the British and French Empire, of course, people were subjects, not citizens. And, um, and the implication of that, of course, is that um, the people who are subjects, the people who are ruled in imperial space, are inferior. Uh, they're not capable of becoming a cultured people. They're not capable of doing what the German people are capable of doing. Um, and, and that racial perspective uh, colours the whole of, of, of uh, German behaviour in Eastern Europe throughout the, the war period, the idea that somehow or other um, they are fitted to rule uh, and the people they conquered are not. How you square that with the fact that the Red Army enters Berlin in 1945, of course, is something that many Germans found difficult to cope with. Sorry, I can't hear. Sorry, uh, do they think that um, the Germans are descendant of Iranians oh, sorry, you lost the third as a question. superior right. race? Well, no, there were lots of strange theories, and Himmler was particularly attracted to the idea of tracing Aryan roots somewhere in, uh, in southern Asia. Uh, but this was really a fantasy. There were plenty of Aryan theorists uh, who argued that the Aryans were Europeans. Um, and, and white Europeans, and that was, you know, that was where the heritage lay. So there was a great deal of confusion about this, uh, 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 these anthropological fantasies um, that, um, that uh, racists in Germany traded on. Yes, some, you know, some thought you could trace the ancestry back to uh, I Iran or Afghanistan or wherever. Um, but the, the main emphasis really was that you know, the Aryan people were white Europeans. And indeed, Norwegians might qualify as Aryans, and indeed the British, perhaps. Uh, Knut uh, Bjørnesset, um, I have a short but uh, probably difficult question. Given the facts you had on the 1st of September, Germany had just attacked Poland, what do you think the Western powers should have done to prevent what later happened? Uh, well, I think there was nothing they could have done, actually, to prevent that from happening. Um, uh, if Hitler was determined on, on that local war and persuaded himself it could remain local, he was going to have that war. So there was nothing the British and French could do. They made it clear to Hitler, and particularly Chamberlain, on numerous occasions in the weeks leading up to the outbreak of war, that if if he did invade Poland, that, that would be uh, a ground for war, that Britain would declare war. Uh, he made it clear, and uh, it was Hitler who disregarded these statements and said that, you know, in the end they would just make theatre, he called it. They would just pretend, but they're not actually going to, to go to war. So it's hard to think, actually, what else the British and French could do. Um, but it is also worth remembering what I said in the lecture, of course, is that they had no intention of helping Poland. <laughs> Um, when the Poles asked for money and arms, they didn't get them. Uh, when the British and French in private discussed what they would do with Poland, uh, Gamelin said, he, well, he promised the Poles that he would, you know, the French army would go into action. So he said, no, actually, we're not going to do that at all. Uh, there's no way we can save Poland. So the war wasn't about Poland. The war was about Germany. Um. Um, Östen Hetland from the Holocaust Center. You <clears throat> pointed out that there is a um, slight inconsistency when it comes to German policy towards Poland, that Poland took part in the partition of, of Czechoslovakia, that Poland might become sort of a German satellite. But then on the other hand, when the Germans actually attack Poland, they have quite elaborate plans about what they're going to do with Poland, with the Einsatzgruppen and the whole racial reorganization and all of that. So, uh, was there ever, at which point did Hitler believe that war with Poland was inevitable, that it was coming? Or was uh, there actually such a point? Did Hitler believe to the end that the Poles might actually give in? 
like, uh, or, or did he believe, at some point believe that war with Poland is now inevitable, it, it will happen in any case? Or did he, in, quite to the end, believe that the Poles could give in? Yes, I mean, it's a good question because it's actually quite hard to pin it down. And I mean, I, I think I said that the origins of the idea of the Einsatzkopf and the destruction of the Polish elites, um, you know, the key evidence is still missing. But it's clearly something which happens in the weeks leading up to the actual invasion of Poland. Uh, but for Hitler, yes, the war with Poland, whatever the Poles had done, and they did make concessions or talk about, you know, the possibility, etc., etc., but every time Hitler uh, was adamant about what he wanted, um, and he would, as with the Czechs, he would have changed. He would have changed the rules of the game every time the Poles made some kind of concession because he wanted that war. Um, but it is interesting to to think that that here's a system which is not geared for war against Poland, in which the Poles are regarded often in quite friendly terms. Hermann Göring, for example, goes hunting trips in Poland throughout the period up to '39, uh, has many Polish friends. Um, uh, the, the shift. Um, into turning Poland into, uh, I, I described it as a mortal enemy, is quite difficult to follow. Um, but clearly, you know, it comes a point at which Hitler thinks that he can go further and faster than he could before. But that, you know, if the Poles are not going to, you know, make way, then he's going to carve out uh, his empire from from Poland, um, because Czechoslovakia and Austria are not enough. Uh, he's going to take Poland as well. But that train of thinking uh, is quite difficult to pin down. We have, a, you know, we have evidence from certain meetings where Hitler says X and says Y. But the problem for the historian is that Hitler liked talking in private. He liked talking uh, face to face. He didn't like writing things down. So that, you know, in the, in the British and French case, we can trace everything that's happening, you know, the change in thinking and so on, the change in planning. But in the German case, it's much more difficult. Um, but what we do know, I say, is the end result. The end result is war and uh, a program of atrocities, um, which make the Polish war distinct from uh, the other wars of the, uh, of the, the earlier wars, the late 19th century and the First World War. Um, hi, uh, Nick Brandel, Bjorknes University College. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating and interesting lecture. Uh, I'm especially fascinated by your uh, your point about the British and the French being source of in this uh, idea of repeating the First World War uh, with the war of attrition on the Western Front. And one of the, but it also at the same time it seems unclear whether they had really learned. Or, or remember, were able to remember the most important lesson of the campaign on the Western Front, namely the necessity of having a centralized command, military command, free from politics, uh, political intervention, free from national interest. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of, um, yeah, could you, if you could please comment a bit on how far the military planning of having a centralized command which was, which it would seem was was missing when the Western campaign started in uh, in 1940. Yes, yeah, interesting question. I mean, in fact, they did want to solve that problem, so they created a Supreme War Council uh, in in uh, late 1939, uh, which was designed to do exactly that, which was to make sure that the British and French would, were were on the same wavelength, that they would pursue the same strategy. Uh, and that the British would gradually build up their forces so that it would be possible to coordinate what it was that they were doing. And they went back to uh, Marshal Foch and 1918. They thought, you know, now we're going to... It's a rerun, in effect, of what had happened in 1918. What they might have... Uh, and and that, that structure remained up, uh, you know, through uh, the crisis in May and June 1940. Uh, and the real problem is that the, the French strategy was completely hopeless um, and uh, you know they did everything wrong that you could do in the, the campaign of May 1940 and the one thing they might have learnt from was the German March Offensive of 1918 which in the end ground to halt because the Germans were just they were running out of manpower running out of material uh, you know it was a last fling but it was a very dangerous last fling 
Um, and that, of course, is exactly what the Germans did in 1939, uh, sorry, 1940. They did go back and look at that. They spent a lot of time in the 1920s going over, refighting the Kaiserschlacht and thinking about ways in which you might get it right next time. Um, and in 1940, they were, in a sense, you know, refighting the First World War, refighting the First World War with revamped military doctrine. Um, uh, and the French and, and the British, you know, imagined that you could bottle the Germans up and it would be an easy thing to do. Right? Um, and that once you bottled them up, well, then you had the, le the leisure to think about what would happen, you know, a year ahead or two years ahead. They fixated on a long war where the Germans were fixated on the, crucial, the critical battle because you can't afford a long war. Critical battle is what you need and that's what they got. Right? Tom Sorsa. Um, you mentioned in your lecture that uh, in Britain and France you had huge anti-war um, sentiments in, in, in the populations. Uh, how were the sentiments in Germany both before and after the invasion of Poland September 1st? Thank you. Uh, well, there's quite a lot of good work done on, on this now. Um, much of the Polish public uh, swallowed the propaganda in the summer of 39. They'd come to see Poland as an enemy committing atrocities against Germans and that, that they would be punished for that. Um, and um, uh, uh, and um, they were not sure exactly what it was that the regime was going to do. Um, until it became clear with mobilization what, what, what the regime was going to do. Um, but much of the German public was deeply worried, much more than Hitler was, that Britain and France would act in September 39. And when the war broke out and World War broke out, we know from diary entries, from private, I mean, you couldn't say it out loud, but, but we know from private diary entries and letters and so on that people were deeply troubled Another repeat of 1914-18, more, more and more dead Germans. You know, how can we do it again in a generation? In fact, much the way that the British and French public thought. Um, the difference was, of course, that they won the war in Poland very easily. Um, and that was a relief. The British and French did nothing. Um, then German armies poured into France in 1940. And France was incredibly defeated in six weeks when they couldn't do it in four years in 1914-18. And Hitler's public popularity reaches its peak in July 1940. Uh, he seems to have defeated Britain and France. He seems to have established um, hegemony across the whole of the European continent. I and mean, the German people breathe a sigh of relief. Now the war is over. Uh, the war isn't over, of course. Um, and uh, from then on, um, but the German public has this very ambivalent view of what it is that Hitler expects of them. Um, I'm Christian Piemel from the University of Oslo. Um, thank you for your talk and uh, the refreshingly uh, revisionist reading of that. At times it had a bit of a sleepwalking, clerkish tinge to it, um, a rereading in which um, the, um, the involved statesmen are more or less um, um, sober in what they're doing. There seem to be a certain rationale. Uh, in that sense, you might say there's also the Taylor aspect. Um, still, uh, there were bits and pieces where it just didn't buy the argument in its overall drive. And I would say there's obviously, you should never um, credit the Nazi regime with more consistency and co coherence than it ever had, because it was that was not its strength, essentially. So there were a lot of kind of turns and uh, deviation like that. Still, I would say that between 1936 and 1940, 19, there is a certain dynamic which has a logic. And um, the four-year plan, as the directors famously says, in four-year times, both the economy and the German army are supposed to be ready for war. Now, the, you would say the, the flavor of the entire directive is not, I would say, for a small, small war. It's not quite clear what that war is. I'm totally in agreement with that. But it doesn't really sound like a small war. So it sounds more like the beginning of something bigger, whatever that beginning actually that might mean. The, and the point that you just made, to some extent, I think is quite important. You said that everyone was surprised by the fact that France was defeated so easily. So the West was not the logical first target anyway, because Nazi Germany did not believe it could win uh, a war in the, in the West. On the Eastern hand, because of the racism that you uh, elaborated on, that was supposed to be much, much easier. So Poland, I would say, was in many respects a logical 
a choice. Maybe not exactly at that point of time, September 1st, 1939, but it had to be that. A, because it fit in well into the racist overall picture. It fit in well into the idea of getting the space for agriculture. In terms of industrial things, it wasn't that important because it couldn't help with rubber, it couldn't help with uh, metals for alloys, it couldn't help with um, oil. But the key point then was just all that was supposed to be gotten from the Soviet Union. Now, how do you attack the Soviet Union without attacking Poland first? So, in a sense, I would say there is a, a, a building up logic there, which makes it, I would say, a little more, well, not determined uh, in a deterministic way, but a little more um, yes, logical, a little more rational to end up where you are, say in 1939, say in 1940. And you might say the overall point is, and I think that you brought this up quite nicely, the Nobel was only alternative to war. The Nazi regime had no po long-term politics apart from going to war. So that was out of the question anyway. Well, it's not war just for its own sake. It is war for, for building a powerful German empire and turning Germany into a world power. Um, and Hitler... Uh, I mean, Hitler is not consistent generally. I mean, there, is, there, is, there are a set of aspir... In other words, he doesn't plan, as, as I said at the beginning... And there's clearly no plan, no blueprint. But he has aspirations, and those aspirations are that Germany will become a great power, a superpower perhaps, and it will base that superpower strength in the end on establishing military and economic domination of, uh, of the whole of Eurasia, which is what, of course, they aim for eventually in 1941. And, um, the war against the West is, is something which you know, he wants to postpone, uh, but you know, it may well become inevitable because they will react to German power and as German power spreads and the empire uh, consolidates, uh, the British Empire and the United States may well become you know, the new mortal enemies and he will have to contest, uh, and contest those at, at some point. Um, so there is a build-up, the four-year plan. I mean, it's called a four-year plan because there's been a first four-year plan, so well, like Stalin's five-year plans, I think we shouldn't take the four years necessarily seriously. Um, but what is clear is that the extent of German rearmament, the thinking about the blockade-free economy, yes, the massive resources which is devoted to, um, to war by 1939, are intended for big wars in the 1940s. And unspecified, there's, there's no, I say, no blueprint written down. Uh, but clearly he expects that German power will be contested and that the only way you're going to be able to build this Eurasian empire and to defend it uh, is to make sure that you're armed sufficiently and you get access to the materials and resources that you that you need. Um, and Poland is a stepping stone. No, it doesn't have rubber uh, or tungsten, but it, it has a great deal of coal um, and uh, iron resources and um, uh, other minerals because they draw up a list of what, what is, what's under the ground in Poland, as they do with the Czechs and with the Austrians too. Um, so that Poland um, can be integrated quite easily into that larger economic area. Um, and then you launch a war of, against the Soviet Union um, so that you can embrace an even larger economic area with very rich resources um, and um, exploit those to the full. Now, this is strategic fantasy. All of this is strategic fantasy. I mean, I mean you know, whatever consistency one can see in Hitler's thinking or his aspirations, in the end, thinking that in 1939, 1940, 1941, you can carve out a huge territorial empire again from existing sovereign states uh, is a fantasy. It's a fantasy the Japanese trade on. It's a fantasy that Mussolini and the Italians trade on. Um, because it's all they've got. It's anachronistic. We look back to an age of empire when Britain, France, and so on became great because they had these huge global empires. So you know, you're going to get a, a big empire as well. And then when the empires are all in place, you shake down and see what the global, what the global order looks like. But all these are, as I said, you know, they're fantasy empires. Um, and you know, in 1945, they're all in tatters. Uh, because they are fantasy empires. You can't carve um, huge new territorial empires out of the global order in the 1930s and 1940s uh, and expect to succeed. Or if they had succeeded, we'd be living in a very different mm. global order today. What if? <laughs> Richard. Sorry, I have a bad hip. My name is uh, Richard Arneson. I'm simply a lifelong student of... 
Who told you it was on? It's on. You just have to ah. <laughs> My name you, is Richard Arneson. Oop. Sorry, bad hip. And I'm simply a lifelong student of the Second World War. I have one question for you. The invasion of Poland went rather smoothly. Four weeks' time it was over, and it was portrayed by the propaganda apparatus as a colossal victory, and the German army was simply unstoppable. If one digs a little bit deeper, one will find that the wear and tear on the army and also on the Luftwaffe was tremendous. Lorries, trucks, tanks broke down at a horrible rate. Um, but some historians argue that at that time when Hitler was, if not fully, at least he was partly mobilized, he wanted, he wanted to turn west and go for France and the Low Countries, while his generals persuaded him that it was technically impossible for the, for the army to pursue that path now simply because they didn't, they didn't have the uh, resources to do it. Hence, he had to postpone until the following spring. Do you know if British and French intelligence were aware of the deficiencies within the British army? Because they evidently you know, took no, no notice of it. Mm. Well, I mean, good question. Yeah, they did spend a lot of time, and the American military too, actually, you know, spent a lot of time making intelligence evaluations of what had happened in the Polish campaign. Um, but they didn't focus a great deal on what went wrong. They focused a great deal on what they had to learn. Um, uh, and did they need to do the same things that the Germans did? Well, they didn't, of course. Um, uh, and it took a long time before they, those lessons became embedded. Um, I think that's really what they, were, what they were interested in. But you're quite right, of course, that you know, waging modern war, even against an enemy that you don't rate a great deal, involves a huge amount of wear and tear. And later on, too, when the Americans and the British seemed apparently unstoppable after D-Day and so on, or indeed in North Africa. Uh, numerous mistakes were made, lots of technical shortcomings and so on. In other words, there were lots of pluses but lots of minuses. And, and waging modern war with modern weapons um, you know, exposes those, uh, those deficiencies. But no, the German army could not possibly have invaded France in November 1939. Uh, uh, and indeed, the British and French knew that. But they did also know um, that, that this was a danger. They thought very much that this was a danger or a possibility, but, um, but you know everything was against it. Um, but they also made the mistake of thinking that if the Germans invaded in the spring of 1939, which seemed very probable, they would stop them in their tracks uh, and set up that continuous front, which they wanted. Any more questions from the audience? I don't know. No, I don't. I don't. Uh, my name is uh, Tobias Satter, and I have one question, uh, yeah, kind of zooming out a little bit, related also to what you said about uh, a new age of imperialism. Um, so there is an emerging literature, yeah, kind of tracing the first, second, and sometimes even the Cold War to as a crisis of modernity or using modernity as a background, sometimes even using it as, a, as causes, so effects launched by modernity. For example, ideologies um, sometimes talk about scientific racism, um, ideologies such as liberalism and, and um, nationalism, and I wanted to kind of hear your thoughts about about this. What happens if we zoom out and look at the Second World War in that context of modernity? Well, modernity is very difficult, and we you know that you know, people who write about modernity and the Holocaust and so on have had a great deal of criticism because modernity is a rather uh, it is a rather vacuous thing, and it, you know how it, what it causes is very difficult for us as historians, I think, to uh, to to pinpoint. I mean, I think that if if we're to um, apply the idea of modernity to the things I've been talking about, particularly about the imperialism of the 1930s, uh, there is a strong 
sense in all three of the new imperial powers, Japan, Italy, and, and Germany, that they are bringing a kind of progressive enlightenment, in fact, to the people that they're colonizing. You know, they're going to be building roads, they're going to be um, you know, developing areas that are under, you know, undeveloped, they're going to improve agriculture and so on and so on, which is precisely what the British and French were arguing about their empires, justifying their empires because they were going to be modernizing their empires. And, you know, if you had to justify it at all, you justified it because you were modernizing. Well, that, that uh, rhetoric is used actually by the Germans too in, in Poland and later on in the, in the Soviet Union. And to that extent, you can hijack the idea uh, that, you know, that, that there are modern progressive peoples and there are backward peoples or barbarous peoples. It's quite interesting that, that one of the first radio broadcasts that Hitler makes at the beginning of the war describes the Poles... It says the Poles, if they hadn't been defeated, uh, sorry, if they hadn't been invaded, there would, there would have been the worst barbarism. And that's quite interesting that, that you know, already Hitler is using rhetoric to turn the Poles back into a barbarous people. Uh, um, so that the contrast between the modernizing state that's engaged in imperialism and the people who are being imperialized um, is an important element, perhaps, in, in, in that discourse. Ideology, I've always had problems with ideology because this is supposed to be the great age of ideological wars, liberalism, communism, fascism, and so on. But, but in the end, you know, despite the ideology, you know, ideological opposites could live with each other without much difficulty. Um, what mattered was territory. Um, and what mattered in the 1930s was territory, getting more physical territory and to control it. That's what the Japanese wanted in Manchuria and northern China. It's what uh, the Germans wanted in Eastern Europe. It's what the Italians wanted in Africa. Um, and, you know, this is driven by very different systems, which don't necessarily have a common ideology, but what they are driven by is a desire for territory and a desire to rule subject peoples. And, yes, perhaps to do so... Um, as modernizing agents uh, when it came to dealing with uh, those subject areas. Um, so, that, I mean, there's something to play for with modernity, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an awkward concept to apply to the practical issues we're talking about. Well, I think we are drawing this session to a close, but I have one topic that I would like to raise before I invite... Uh, Guri to share her thoughts uh, with us, and that is it's a, it's a tendency in, in in the UK, as well as in in the Scandinavian countries, that the lack of military preparedness, the appeasement policies, and things like that, in a way, made the temptation uh, irresistible for Hitler and for for, for the expansionist uh, uh, countries. Um, is there a point at all in that? You mentioned, for example, the, uh, all the preparations and the rearmament program of, of Chamberlain. But nonetheless, he has, became, has become the, the, the parent of, 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 uh, of scapegoats, mm. so to speak. And, and we have the same situation in this country that the, the social, social, uh, social democratic uh, government that was responsible for a fairly big, vast uh, rearmament program from 1936-37 was blamed f for, you know, almost inviting an attack. So do you think there is a point in that at all, that the lack of prepare military preparedness and appeasement in a way tempts the fascists to attack and expand? Well, I mean, there's a sense, of course, in which you, 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 it's all in the eye of the beholder. You want to believe that Britain and France are declining powers, and that you are rising powers. Uh, the real problem is that Britain and France are completely overcommitted. You know, the, 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 it's not a question of confronting Germany. It's a question of trying to stabilise their imperial position in South Asia and uh, Southeast Asia. It's about the Middle East, where they're extremely vulnerable. It's about Africa. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's about multiple threats uh, where really whatever you do and by 1938-39 British and French rearmament spending is way beyond anything in peacetime that done before uh, but you can't do everything you can't 
defend against Japan, you can't defend against Italy, and you can't defend against Germany at the, at the same time. And so all three of those powers were able to, to perceive, if you like, that relative weakness. Um, you know, what are the British and French going to do? And in the end, British and French decided that of the three threats, the German one is the one they're going to, to face up to. Um, and they, you know, by 1939, are outproducing Germany in uh, a great many uh, major weapons classes, tanks particularly. Uh, and so they do think themselves, of course, that you know, they've reached a point where uh, they can contemplate a war with Germany uh, more easily than they could before. The problem is, is intelligence in Germany, uh, which is uniformly not very good. I, I mean, in this case, military intelligence. Um, Hitler is fed with a whole lot of material from 37, 38 onwards, which plays down what the French and British are doing. Um, it, it presents a picture in 39 of unpreparedness, of um, a poor state of the French and British economies and so on. Uh, the French and British publics won't put up with this for very much longer and so on and so on. Uh, in other words, it's a, it's a mirror image of the way in which the British and French are thinking about the Germans um, in 39. And Hitler says to his generals on a number of occasions, what does, what does French and British rearmament amount to? doesn't amount to very much. Uh, and never really spends much time assessing seriously what sort of military threat the French or the British might uh, um, might pose. Um, but they do pose a threat, of course, by, by 39. Um, they have been rearming. Um, we might argue that they should have shouted that a little bit more loudly. Um, but they also thought, you know, that there must be room for manoeuvre. I think for the British and French it was un inconceivable that... Uh, by 1939, uh, Germany would once again be in a position where they would risk the waging of world war. Uh, and so appeasement, whatever its weakness is, is really about, you know, let's find a rational way of sorting out what's, what's going on in Europe and what's wrong in Europe. It's also governed in the British and French case by a profound fear of communism. In other words, that the enemy they're looking at a lot of the time is the Soviet Union, not Germany. Mm -hmm. They're wondering what the Soviet Union will do. Will it profit from their problems. Will the Soviet Union push on into Afghanistan and India? Um, you know, what, what are communist plans in, uh, in Eastern Asia? And we've lost sight of this entirely, that if you like, there's an early Cold War going on in the 1930s as well. Uh, and so Britain and France are looking over their shoulder the whole time at what's happening in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and that, it takes some time before they realise that you know, they've, they've really got to focus on Germany as the main threat. And then when the Nazi-Soviet pact comes, they think, oh, well, just what we expected. The Soviet Union is an enemy too. And so you know, our imperial projects are really now under threat because there's a Soviet threat as well. Um, so a rather rambling answer, but, but you know, appeasement is understandable. Mm. given the nature of the multiple threats that they're facing. They're balancing all the time, throwing the balls in the air and hoping that somehow or other they keep juggling. Mm. Well, Goody. Yeah, well, we're closing in soon, but I mean, since you're here, it's a privilege that you have come to this country and you have a busy schedule. Um, and uh, you've been in this field since the 1970s and you followed uh, the research and development. What, we, what is the most important changes and developments in the research and writing on the world wars in these decades you've been in the field? And have you changed all of these fields? And, uh, and also the third point, mm. where should we continue to mm. dig? Where mm. have you not been digging? And what perspective do we still lack? Well, that's a very big question. <laughs> Divided into three. <laughs> Uh, it's a very big question. That's, uh, I think one, that's point, pin, point one thing for a start, I think, which is that um, uh, you know, we're all now aware of the way in which the Holocaust and anti-Semitism feeds into what happens in the Second World War. And, and uh, um, when I first started working on the Second World War in the 1970s, it was just not something people, people thought about. It was put into a separate box. Mm. Um, and it wasn't something that you related to uh, the Second World War and all the expansion of the Second World War into a really genuinely global war in 1941-42. And I think that that's something nobody can do now. You know, you can't that's write impossible. a history of the Second World War without talking about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
And that's a big change. And I'm very ashamed because one of the, my early books, uh, The Nazi Economic Recovery, um, uh, published in the early 1980s, actually makes no mention of Aryanization at all. Um, or the decision to expropriate the Jews taken in 1936 with the four-year plan so you could start taking Jewish wealth and so on and using it to support uh, German rearmament. And it, it just wasn't it wasn't on the radar. It wasn't the way in which we thought about writing economic history. But you, nobody could write now about the German economy in the 1930s without talking about aeronization. Um, the other really big change, and we talked about this earlier, of course, is the globalization of the war. That so much of the writing of the war is focused on the Western war effort, North Africa, Normandy, uh, German defeat. Uh, first of all, there was a wave of new research on the Soviet war effort made possible in 1990 by, the ac by open access to Soviet uh, archives, now closed, sadly. Um, and the second thing is just the opening up of the history of the war in Asia, about which people knew almost nothing. Um, and it featured hardly at all in general histories of the uh, Second World War, more or less as a, as a, as a footnote. Um, but now we, we have a, a huge literature, um, Japanese, Chinese literature, uh, which is making its way into the Anglophone world. Um, and we just know a great deal more now about that conflict and what fueled it. Um, so that we can now actually write a global history of the Second World War, which we couldn't have done, I think, even 20 or 25 years ago. And, uh, a genuinely global history. And the interesting thing is that, that puts our European bit of the story in, into a rather different perspective. But you, and you are publishing a book next year on the World War. I am. It's called what a is your perspective? A then? global history. Is that the, the global World history? Yeah. So that it's the global history? Well, it will be a global history. But I won't be. <laughs> it sadly won't be the global history, no. Uh. <laughs> um, I mean, nobody can write a book on the Second World War now, given the huge amount of literature that's available, uh, and, and hope remotely to be definitive. I mean, it's a book with arguments in it, and that's, it's trying to answer big questions, but it's not going to be a, a comprehensive global history. What do we not know? Sorry? Where should we dig on? Anything we should actually focus on, in addition to what you said on the global history? But hmm. Um, well, I mean, there are lots of corners to be, you know, small points to be filled in, corners to be examined. I mean, I think actually we have a more open book now about the Second World War than we had 20 years ago. And, and so that, you know, well, 20 years ago, after that question, I'd say, yes, we need much more on Japan and China. We need to know really what was going on in the Soviet Union and so on. And these were all areas of the war which have now been largely filled in. There's a lot of work being done on the war in Africa and the impact mm. on African societies and mm. so on. And that's also another dimension that's being, um, that's being developed. Um, but no radical change, I think, in the way in which we, which we think about the war. Um, but globalizing of the story, I think, is in itself mm. a, 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 an important uh, redirection. Um, and imperial historians, historians of empire, in other words, are taking that story uh, a, a, a long way. I owe a lot now to people who've been working on uh, empire in a broad sense uh, over the last 20 years, because that's opened my eyes to ways about thinking about German imperialism or Japanese or Italian imperialism, the things I was talking about mm. this evening. Mm. Oh, what will be the title of your book? Sorry? What will be the title of your book? Well, it's called Blood and Ruins, <laughs> which is a quotation from Leonard Wolf, the, uh, the British political scientist, mm. uh, Virginia Woolf's husband. <laughs> but blood and, blood and Ruins seem to me a good way of describing the war. Okay. And on that positive note, I think we shall, I think we shall uh, close this session. And I would like to thank the audience for engaging in the debate and for listening uh, patiently. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Richard Overy for no, your no, been, brilliant been, lecture it's been, it's been my pleasure. and, and yeah. for your <laughs> answering and taking part in the debate. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we do, we do have
have a symbolic gift. I'm sorry about the bag, but it's been raining today. It has. <laughs> so we have visited our good friends at the Nolk Folks Museum. You couldn't go there today. We have suggested you should go there, but it's raining. So there are actually some really Norwegian nationalistic gifts to uh, Aubrey and his family. Right, thank and you. we should actually invite for the next uh, lecture, Tuesday, September 10th. Am I correct? Hmm. Tuesday, September 10th. Six o'clock, Maria Fritsche. Thank you so much, Professor Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.